Hey guys, Sean here. Welcome to the F1 Word and to another F1 Experimental. Yep, that's apparently what I'm calling these now. So, so far we've cancelled the first seven races of 2009, swapped the point scoring system between 1999 and 2019. And today I'm looking at how the 2019 championship would have finished if we only took the results from qualifying. Basically, I'm imagining that race day didn't exist, which is all too familiar right now. So here's how I've gone about this. The point scoring system is largely the same as it was for races in 2019. So that's 25 points for the win, or in this case, pole position. You'd get 18 points for second place, 15 for third, running all the way down to 1.4 10th place. I am not going to include a point for fastest lap because that's always going to be the pole sitter, pretty much always anyway. So if I was doing that, I might as well have just made it 26 points for pole. So no point for fastest lap. So essentially, I suppose the 2018 point scoring system and these results will also be taken before any post-session penalties were applied, and that is as per the official F1 website. Basically, unless someone was listed as not classified, their lap in quali would stand. So as an example, possibly a controversial example, Max Verstappen would have kept his pole position in Mexico, and Lewis Hamilton would not have taken that grid drop in Austria. There were, to be fair, only a couple of examples of drivers potentially missing out on points due to being unclassified, and I did decide to go over all of the maths for that just to make sure that nothing changed, and apart from points tally, nothing changed in terms of championship position. But anyway, that's kind of all the rules, if you like, out of the way. We'll start, as we always do with these videos, by having a look at the final official standings from last year, so a bit of a reminder. As I'm sure you all remember very well, Lewis Hamilton made it six world titles last year. 413 points and Valtteri Bottas was in second place on 326. Max Verstappen was third on 278 points. Then we've got Charles Leclerc in fourth and Sebastian Vettel in fifth. Carlos Sainz was, I suppose, best of the rest in sixth place. Pierre Gassi seventh on 95 points. Alex Albon eighth on 92. Very close between those three drivers. And it was just as close between Daniel Ricciardo and Sergio Perez. Danny Rick in ninth and Sergio Perez in tenth. And that's 54 points and 52 points, respectively. Lando Norris just missed out on the top 10 in 11th place. And we've got Kimi Raikkonen in 12th, Daniel Kvyat in 13th. He had 37 points, as did Nico Hülkenberg in 14th place. And then it's Lance Stroll 15th, Kevin Magnussen 16th, Antonio Giovinazzi in 17th place. Roman Grosjean ended up 18th on 8 points. And then it's Robert Kubica in 19th place with a point for Williams and George Russell, the only driver who failed to score last year. Right then, let's crack on with this. Once again, I did all of the maths myself and then double-checked it against the points website. Pretty much just for my own OCD and, well, yeah, sanity or what's left of it. I will this time try and remember to link the website in the description for anybody who wants to take a look at that site and maybe run their own experiments. It's a really handy site, to be fair, especially given we've got no F1 really to talk about at the minute so we can play around with things a little bit. And just super quickly as well, and I really wish I'd said something similar to this in the cancelling race in 2009 video, but this does not take into account every single aspect that would come if we only had qualifying. You know the kind of thing I'm talking about, the, oh, actually, I think you'll find that the teams would have likely focused on a car more capable of delivering over one lap rather than a full race. Which, yeah, if that was the case, would likely change these scores and positions somewhat. But we will work backwards, starting with Robert Kubica and George Russell, who both, unsurprisingly, pick up no points. And if you're wondering, the reason Russell is listed ahead of Kubica is because of that 16th place during qualifying in Hungary, and that would have been enough to give him the edge on countback. I don't think this will surprise too many people, but Lance Stroll picked up just two points all year if we look at qualifying, and ended up 18th place, down three places and 19 points worse off. And those two points came, by the way, because of his ninth place in Italy. Yeah, not great at all. Antonio Giovinazzi stays in 17th place, but on just nine points. Daniel Kvyat finds himself dropping three places, 21 points worse off on 16. And Sergio Perez drops five places to 15th and just 18 points. That was a big surprise when I did this, I can't lie. Raikkonen drops a couple of places to 14th, 28 points. And these are the big movers or positive movers, if you like. Obviously, Perez dropping five places is a pretty big fall. But Roman Grosjean leaps all the way up into 13th place, a move of five places, and finds himself 28 points better off. We'll talk about all of this properly a little bit later, but that is a big move. Nico Hülkenberg does move up a couple of places and is a point better off on 38th. And then Kevin Magnussen, just like his teammate, makes a move of five places and is 21 points better off on 41. I think it's pretty safe to assume we all knew where Hass's struggles were last year. But when you actually get it all written down, you can really see the difference between their Saturdays and their Sundays. Definitely a season of what could have been for Haas. 
Like I say though, we'll talk more about that when I summarise later. But into the top 10 and Alexander Albon actually drops two places, 35 points worse off on 57. Daniel Ricciardo does stay in ninth place, but is actually six points better off with Lando Norris moving three places up the table into eighth place, picking up 67 points along the way. And interestingly enough, is only two points behind his teammate Carlos Sainz, who was seventh on 69 points, 27 points worse off than he was actually in 2019. Pierre Gasly ended up in sixth place on 80 points, moving up one place. And then we move on to the bit that I think a lot of people are going to be really interested in, and that's the top five. And it's Max Verstappen who falls furthest here, down two places into fifth place, 277 points. But he is closer to Lewis Hamilton. 104 points is the adjusted gap, whereas the official gap last year was 135. Sebastian Vettel moves up a place into fourth place, 286 points for him. But again, closer to Lewis Hamilton, substantially closer, actually. Looking back to last year, he was 173 points off come the end of Abu Dhabi. But in this experiment, he finds himself just 95 points off the top of the table. And it's a similar story for Charles Leclerc as well in third place, 314 points in total, up one place, but just 67 points off Lewis Hamilton as opposed to 149. But did we see a change in world champion? Long story short, no. I don't think too many people will be surprised to hear that one, but it was a hell of a lot closer, as we've seen really through the entirety of the top five so far. Valtteri Bottas finished on 342 points, but only 39 points off his teammate. We'll talk about the title battle in a moment anyway, and it was definitely much closer. Lewis Hamilton then world champion, 381 points, and 32 points worse off than his actual tally in 2019. So yeah, we've seen title changes in the other experiments we've done, but nothing today. But the championship fight is still definitely worth a mention. I suppose, again, long story short, we would have had one. Now, it wouldn't have gone all the way down to Abu Dhabi, which I think is what we all want to see, but Bottas would have kept the fight alive until Brazil. The gap between the two Mercs would have been 27 points when they arrived at Interlagos, and so with 50 points still up for grabs, it certainly would have been an interesting scrap. However, Bottas only managed fifth in quali in Brazil, and Lewis Hamilton was third, and so the Brit would have still won the title with the gap growing to 32 points ahead of Abu Dhabi. And yeah, before anybody points out in the comment section, I know that winning the title in Brazil was only one race later than he did it in the real world, but it would have been a much closer fight. And let's be honest, the 2019 title in the real world was a foregone conclusion by the summer break. So yeah, Lewis would still have won the title, but you wouldn't have had that feeling of inevitability through the second half of the season. There would have been some tension. That's kind of my point. And I'll tell you something else worth noting as well. Charles Leclerc would have been in the title fight all the way up until the US Grand Prix. He'd have left the US Grand Prix 51 points behind Lewis Hamilton with 50 points still available. And you know what, actually? Vettel wasn't all that far off Leclerc either, so that could have been tasty. But so would the scrap between Seb and Max, just nine points in it come the end of the season. I suppose ultimately with fewer variables in qualifying versus a race, the chances were that it was always going to be closer if you just looked at the qualifying results. But I'm not going to lie, I'd still much rather have the racing than just qualifying. I'm sure I'm not alone on that one. Although it would add even more tension to a Monaco Grand Prix Saturday, wouldn't it? So that's how the driver standings would have ended up. But what about the constructors? Well, guess what? Mercedes would still have been champions, but the gap to Ferrari in second is closed dramatically. I mean, it's still 123 points, but that's a significant improvement on the official gap of 235 points. Funnily enough, the gap between Mercedes and Red Bull is exactly the same as it was in the real world, if you like, 322 points. But they are a lot further back from Ferrari. McLaren are still in fourth place and Renault fifth, but behind that, it really starts to get interesting. But in sixth place, it is Haas on 77 points, up three places. Ah, so frustrating. Alfa Romeo in seventh place, 37 points, up one place. And then we've got Toro Rosso down two places to eighth on 29 points. Racing Point are also down two places to ninth place, 20 points for them. And Williams, surprise, surprise, no points on the board. So on to a bit of a summary then. Although we didn't get a change in world champions, the gaps would have been a hell of a lot closer if we only took qualifying into account. And it's also a good indication of Bottas's impressive performances. And yeah, definite qualifying improvement compared to previous years. Being 48 points closer based on just qualifying is a significant improvement. It also, again, I suppose unsurprisingly, shows just how much of an advantage Ferrari had on a Saturday and what their power unit was doing for them when it came to one lap pace. 
particularly in the second half of the season, between their two drivers, they took five pole positions in a row between Belgium and Japan, and that would have brought them right into play for the title. And you know, actually, had they had a bit more consistency earlier in the year, they might have caused a bit of a surprise in this experiment. I mean, to be fair to Seb, he was very consistent early doors, a lot of third and second places, but they were obviously nowhere near the levels of Mercedes consistency. Then again, was anybody really? And I suppose something else we can take away from this, and I guess we kind of already knew this, but it's worth a mention anyway, is just how reliant Red Bull were on Max Verstappen's performances. Do you know what I mean? If he'd had a teammate capable of getting close to him during quali, Red Bull would have been so much closer to the teams ahead of them. You just look at the gap, it was the same officially and adjusted. So what Max Verstappen desperately needed next year and what he needs whenever the next season is, is some backup from a teammate on a Saturday. It possibly even highlights where Honda need to be improving as well. We all knew that they would probably struggle during Quali versus Mercedes and Ferrari. And although there's no denying there was definite improvement over the course of the year, there is clearly still work to do. Then again, that's only based on this experiment. In the real world, it is obviously the Sunday that really matters. So is it worth sacrificing that Sunday pace for better pace on a Saturday? Yeah, it's always nicer to start higher up the grid, but points win prizes and points in the real world are only handed out on a Sunday. But in all honesty, for me anyway, the most interesting part of this experiment was that midfield. I mean, look at that leap from Haas into sixth place. Again, that just highlights how poor their race form was in 2019. That car clearly had good raw pace. If they'd have got those tyres and the car working properly on race day, I honestly do believe they would have been a threat to the likes of Renault and maybe even McLaren. That might have been a bit of a stretch, but they would have been right in the fight. And look at Grosjean as well, far closer to Magnussen than even I expected. I suppose, again, highlighting Grosjean's bad luck on race day in 2019. Don't get me wrong, by the way, it didn't help that the two of them kept running into each other on a Sunday, but at least we know for sure what the team need to be working on going forward. Stopping their drivers crashing into each other and trying to deliver the raw pace of that car on a Sunday. It just sounds so easy when you put it like that, doesn't it? But it's far from easy when it comes to Formula 1. That's not the kind of thing they can solve overnight, as we saw last year. But anyway, random tangent, Toro Rosso are an interesting one as well. As you saw, they dropped two places to eighth. And I think it's fair to say that that shows how much heavy lifting those two podiums did for them. Not taking anything away from them, of course, but you've got 18 points for Gazi, 50 for Kvyat. You remove that and just look at their qualifying form and they're a long way off where they ended up. In fact, I'd probably argue, to be fair, that eighth place is about where that car was in terms of raw pace, possibly even ninth because Racing Point also dropped two places tonight, and I'm confident that we can point the finger at Lance Stroll's inability to hook up his one-lap pace for that one. Then again, having said that, 18 points from Perez wasn't exactly spectacular, was it? So perhaps the car is just better in terms of race pace and quality pace, or possibly more likely, Checo is just able to extract the maximum from that car on race day. Either way, though, that Saturday form is something Stroll must work on and improve on because he's got to be doing his bit for the team. Whether he's there because his dad's got the money and owes the team or not, he still needs to be performing. But anyway, yeah, there is definitely one driver carrying that team in general, but certainly when it comes to a Saturday. As I say, it wasn't the most dramatic of experiments when it came to the title, but it definitely highlighted which teams were better on a Saturday. And as those words leave my mouth... I realise how stupidly obvious that was. But anyway, my point is, it shows where teams like Haas got it right and where they got it wrong, and I guess shows the untapped potential that some cars had in terms of raw pace. And it also gives us a good idea too of which drivers were carrying which teams when it comes to qualifying last year, and yeah, how much some drivers have improved, like Bottas for example. I guess what I'm trying to say really is, I found it interesting, but what do you guys think? Are you surprised by anything in those adjusted standings? And what are your takeaways from all of this? You can, as always, let me know your thoughts down in the comments section. Now, I will be back soon with more content as ever. But in the meantime, don't forget that you can, of course, follow me over on social media. And all of the links you need for that are in the description down below. But as ever, thank you for watching and I'll catch you again in the next one. Bye bye.